Well, I'd like to welcome you all to our exploration of the Gospel of John. And whenever we enter the Word of God, we always want to do it with prayer. So let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for your Word. We do pray, Father, through your Holy Spirit, you would open our hearts and lives to your Word, that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our coming Savior, that we might be more pleasing in your sight as we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to, we'll be in session 15. We'll take two chapters tonight, which is a little more aggressive than our usual pattern. Chapters 15 and 16. And uh, in chapter 14, we had the presentation of His grace, one of the most remarkable chapters in the New Testament. In chapter 15, we're going to discover what our responsibility, our responsibility is to that grace. And uh, this session, incidentally, won't make sense to anyone unless you're a believer. It's really designed, but we're in the, what's called the upper room discourse. Jesus is talking to his insiders. And so if you're a non-believer, it'll sound strange or ambiguous or who knows what. But this is, this is addressed to not only believers, but the intimate believers, the ones that are really serious about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, chapter 15 is sometimes called the vine and branches chapter because of the idioms that uh, dominate it. And we're going to explore two concepts, union and communion and unity. They're all very intimate. Uh, and it's an, it, in an intimacy so intertwined it's impossible to speak of one without the other. And so we're going to be in some pretty heavy stuff. But before we do, you'll quickly discover that Jesus draw, uh, calls on a, a, uh, a passage in Isaiah, chapter 5, the first seven verses especially. So we'll just take a quick glimpse of that. Uh, Isaiah 5, starting at verse 1. Now will, I sing, <clears throat> now will I sing to my beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. Now before he's through, Isaiah's going to explain this idiom, but he's using obviously an idiom here. And he fenced it and gathered it out the stones thereof, planted it with a choicest vine, built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. That's not desirable. O oh, now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked at it, should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. I'll break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And it shall, I, I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain that they rain no rain upon it. He's, the, the vineyard keeper is upset, right? He's not getting the fruit that he expected. So, he's, so bad things are going to happen apparently, right? Verse 7, where it explains this idiom he's using. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is what? The house of Israel. And the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness but behold a cry. So that's the Old Testament source of the idiom that Jesus is going to expand on in chapter 15. As you study your Bible, you'll discover that there are two organisms dominant in the Bible. One is Israel. Israel is not a nation. It's contrast to the nations. We always think of Israel as one of the nations. That's the secular point of view. Biblically, there's the chosen people, Israel, and 70 nations. The word nations is used biblically to exclude Israel. It's in contrast, actually. There's a lot of confusion about the church and Israel. There are people teaching that the church is, replaces Israel in the promises, and I won't go down with spend all our time on that tonight. I have the opposite view. I think the Israel is going to replace the church, but that's a whole other study. Let's go on here. The vine is obviously Israel in Isaiah 5. The chief value of the vine is fruit. 
Fruit of the vine is a cup at the Pas- is symbolized by the cup at the Passover meal. And fruit is used eight times in this chapter. And remember, eight is the number of a new beginning. And the, the structure of John. There's another subtlety many people don't realize. As you study uh, John, the Gospel of John, you will gradually become aware of the fact that John wrote this after Patmos. We always tend to think of it as being you know, early in his career. No, he presumes you've read the other Gospels. There's a couple of hints that imply that. But uh, the structure of the Gospel of John is just as rigorous as the sevenfold structure of the book of Revelation. Here it's more subtle, but it also bears evidence of being written since uh, after the Patmos experience. Abide is used 15 times in 10 verses. Abide is a key concept here. And ye is used 22 times. So who is this all about? You, if you're a, seri- if you're a sincere, intimate believer in the Lord. So that's, you're the addressee. So in chapter 15, we're going to explore the following relationships. Our relationship with Christ in the first 11 verses. The relationship with each other in the next few verses. And then our relationship with the world, which is yet another thing. So there's three distinct relationships modeled here in this passage. When we get to chapter 16, we'll see the work of the Holy Spirit to help accomplish all of those things. So we'll jump right in. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, Jesus speaking, and my Father is the husbandman. So that applies the idiom that he's using here. Jesus proclaims his seventh I am statement. There are uh, I am statements, obviously, the structure of the whole book here. He talked about the true light in chapter 1, the true bread in chapter 6, the true tabernacle and so forth the, in Hebrews 8 and elsewhere. And uh, see, a vine that is cared for and carefully pruned by the husbandman will consistently bear fruit. The father is the husbandman. And uh, we see all that echoed in, by the way, Isaiah 53 as other passages. Uh, he's the husband providing protecting care, watchfulness, and so forth. I am the vine, he says, the national symbol of, the, uh, of Israel, a golden vine on the temple gate. And uh, so, and it's the true vine, which is an interesting statement. When he says true vine, that should tip you off that there's such a thing as a false vine. So let's be alert to that. Uh, the true vine distinguishes his reality, his genuineness, from that which is false or unreal. So that's something you want to be sensitized to. And so, and the husbandman. Who is the husbandman? The father. And that's also echoing John 5. We dealt with that before. The father speaks occasions where there's no fruit or some fruit or more fruit and looking for much fruit. Fruit is the yardstick then. And uh, it's the husbandman that cuts both branches that produce and those that do not with different purpose on each. Barren branches are removed so as not to affect the health of the rest of them. And the fruit-bearing branches are also pruned because they'll bear more fruit that way. And those are strange idioms for us to try to apply to our lives, but that's what he's giving us here. And so, every branch in me, Jesus says, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So the uh, word taketh away there can mean several things. Now, there's different views. There are good scholars that apply this in very different ways. And uh, uh, the true believer apostatizing, some people would hold. Can the true believer apostatize? That's a debate uh, that many people enter into. The Arminians say that a Christian who does not abide in Christ loses his salvation. That's their view. That happens not to be our view, but that's not the point. We're not here to sell a view. We're here to help you formulate your own. We'll explain what we believe and why we believe it, but we're not selling that point of view. We're just hoping hope that our perspective may be helpful. The Armenian view seems to be refuted by a series of things, and then your notes, so I won't try to hammer them here vocally. There's the, uh, then there's the eternal security position, or some people would call it the Calvinist position. A mere professor never truly united to Christ is the subject here in their mind. Were they actually branches? Verse says they're in me, they're in Christ. So that tends to refute that particular point of view. There's a third point, the fruit bear, that fruit bearing is the issue, not salvation. And that may be the key to this, because fruit bearing is the subject. The soteriological position of them is something else again. 
Your position in Christ was determined on a cross, erected in Judea 2,000 years ago. Jesus did 100% of the, the, the job. Trying to add to that is blasphemy. So watch out for that one. But fruit bearing is. I often ask an audience, how many are saved? And all the hands will go up and say, great. What have you done with it? They look at me startled. Why were you saved? There's some collective reasons to magnify the name of the Lord and other collective reasons. There's also personal. I believe that every one of us in here, that if I ask you you're saved and your hand goes up, we're saved for a specific reason. And your challenge, your, the adventure in your life is to discover what that reason is. We call that a calling. Many people know they're saved, but when you ask them, what is your calling, they look at you a little blank. I hadn't thought about that. So anyway, fruit bearing is the issue here, and there's several verses on that. You can look that up from your notes. And uh, the, the idea of taketh away, it's the root for resurrection, to take up or lift up. That's really what he's saying here. See, the vine dresser does not cut away a vine, but gently lifts it up to the sun so it has an opportunity to bear fruit. Which, and so... Um, so not judgment, but encouragement is referenced here in Daniel 7, 4 and other places like that. And you can, the verses are in your notes, you can run with that. Fruit or carpon is singular, which implies the character uh, or a fruit of the Spirit. And uh, soul winning is one of the fruit bearing, to attract, convict, and lead to the conversion of others. Many of you are saved, and I won't ask for a show of hands, but have you led someone else to the Lord? That's one of the things he's expecting you to bear fruit. And there's a lot of mix, I think, but just as I'm on that subject, a lot of things, they run around witnessing. He doesn't say to witness, he says, be a witness. Many people are giving answers where the people haven't asked the question. So if your life is the right kind of life, they will be asking you about it, and you respond answering their questions. And uh, I'll let you think about that one. But anyway, the word purgeth, katharai, he cleans. The purpose clause with Hina and the present active subjunctive of Pharaoh, that it may keep on bearing more and more fruit is the idea. And out of the conditions are abiding and cleansing. Two things required. So we're down to verse 3. We're making progress here. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you, Jesus says. Now ye are clean. Now, already. And uh, it's one, uh, note the ye. It's one class, not two. And so um, how are we cleansed? Okay, by the word, of course, and that's old ground for most of you, of course. You're pruned by the master himself. You should count it all joy, James encourages in also Romans 5. He says, abide in me and I in you. You know, those are glib words, but you really want to dwell on that. That takes some time devotionally. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. Only Jesus can bear the fruit. You can't. And uh, abide in me, and I in you. And uh, to remain or stay is what he's saying. And don't confuse this with the phrase to be in Christ. They're two different issues. One is positioned by the new birth. You're a new creature in Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, and so on. Don't confuse that with abiding in Christ. Vigilance, obedience. And uh, that's devoutly to be wished. Abiding cannot come without obedience. Our entire dependency should be upon Him and, get this, Him only. Him only. And uh, not your favorite radio guy or TV guy, not even the pastor in your pulpit. Those are all helpful, hopefully. No, but the key thing, the dependency should be on Jesus Christ. Not the church as an organization. I don't care what denomination you come from. Uh, there are all pluses and minuses to all of them. No, it's the person of Jesus Christ that's the issue. The secret of fruitfulness is found in abiding or remaining in the true vine, not in the effort of the branches trying to produce grapes. Branches can't produce the grapes. They're the means by which the grapes come forth, of course. Apart from its attachment to the vine, the branch is totally useless. How many of us in here are totally useless? My hand is up. Indeed, let's realize that. Seriously. The wood of the vine, by the way, is of such inferior quality, it is not even permitted to be burned on the temple altar. Did you know that? They don't use it for burning. It's useless for that. That also should keep us from getting some bizarre soteriological doctrines floating around. Let's move on. 
Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Fellowship, yes. Union, no. I am the vine, ye are the branches. And that's interesting that the menorah, when he says, I am the, the light of the world, it's one plus six. If you've seen the menorah, one plus six is seven or complete. He's the vine, we're the branches. The menorah even suggests that. And uh, when you study the menorah, there are three feasts of Israel in the first month, three feasts in the seventh month, and this strange one in between, which is the church, born in Acts chapter 2 on the Feast of Shavuot. And what many people haven't perceived yet is that also may be the day that it's resurrected, as, as Enoch was. He was apparently born on that day, and he was translated on his birthday. Will the church be that? It's a provocative question to discuss among yourselves. But Jesus says, for without me you can do nothing. That's not a question of our sufficiency. It's his sufficiency that's the issue here. The branches must bear the grapes. It doesn't produce them. We bear them, but we don't produce them. He does. And that's the current through this whole chapter. Can you sever this union? Big debate about that. Where's the answer? Romans chapter 8 the last few verses, nail that. People say that Paul uh, didn't believe in eternal security. He wrote the book on it. It's called Romans chapter 8, the last half of that chapter. You cannot read that without just, wow, what a trip. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Cast forth. And uh, notice... Uh, uh, not man, unless anyone abide in me, he is cast out as a, as a branch. And again, here again, there's many people have different views of this. Some say this refers to the loss of salvation. That's, some people argue that way. Some argue against it. It's, uh, some say it has to do with presumption. Uh, uh, presumption. Profession without salvation. And, and you can build uh, some sermons on that issue. Some say this is a, uh, simply the believer losing his reward. And that's another view of this. And the a man is singular. It ends with they, their burn, plural. Uh, their, their reward's being lost is the point, and that's the argument. It tends to support the third view. And Lot is an example of that. Lot was uh, an interesting example because uh, Peter calls him saved, the righteous man Lot. And yet his behavior is certainly one we would not want to emulate. And so that raises that, that he tends to be an example of that. Another example says that this deals with the premature death of, a, of the non-abider, where we're stripped of our gifts. And Ananias and Sapphira are an example of that. There's no evidence they lost their salvation. They certainly were taken out of the game. And uh, sin at the Lord's table that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 11, another example of this. Sin unto death in 1 John 5. These are all issues that get raised by these issues, and we're not we're going to try to resolve them here. Verse 7. Jesus says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Wow. That's another echo of 2 Corinthians 10.5, take every thought captive. And you always want to be careful what you pray for, right? And uh, this is an astounding promise and command. In the Greek, it's clear. Ask what ye will. That's pretty wild stuff. The aorist middle uh, imperative, voice of a direct order, ask, not if you ask, it's a command to ask. Different flavor there, isn't it? This must be, of course, in harmony and intimate communion, abiding his word. That's taken for granted here. Can you abuse this? Of course you can, but that's, let's, let's hear what it's telling us. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Herein, now that ties it back to the union with Christ and backwards and forward to fruit bearing. That's the linkage. Herein, my Father is glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. And uh, neither are an end in themselves, but rather to the end of bringing glory to the Father. That's what he's all about. That's what we should be all about. How do you bring glory to the Father? By bearing fruit for him. And uh, the fruit of the vine, Hosea 14 talks about that. We'll keep moving here. Psalm 1, well, the very opening psalm in the, in the book of Psalms, he that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, that's the main theme even in the first psalm. 
the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is character. In Galatians 5 lists those. The fruit unto holiness, that deals with our conduct in Romans 6. The fruit of righteousness, that's contentment in Hebrews 12 and Philippians 1. The fruit of the lips, our conversation. And uh, the fruit of our hands, concrete service for, uh, for God. The fruit of righteous, of the righteous, which are converts. The righteous produce converts. And the voice, the fruit of the womb, which is to generate spiritual children, to make disciples. And since these all start with C, you know that came out of the seminary, right? If it's alliterative, you know it must be true, right? And I'm being facetious, of course. So shall ye be. It's in the future tense, emphasizing that true discipleship is a growing experience. It's the journey, not the arrival. Fruits of righteousness, Philippians 1. The love of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5. The joy of Christ in John 15. We're going to run into that here. The joy is going to be emphasized here. The peace of Christ, we talked about that the last time. And the meekness and gentleness in 2 Corinthians 10. All things through whom? Him. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Okay. The term semi-retirement, a lot of people tell me they're semi-retired. I don't think that's possible in the service of God, by the way. And uh, we cease glorifying the Father, we stop bearing fruit. We, if we fall short of the ultimate discipleship level, bring forth old age, Psalm 92 talks about. As the, Father has, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Wow! Think about that for a moment. As the Father loved the Son, the Son loves us. That's a staggering, staggering statement. We're going to really explore that in the next few chapters as we watch the Son willingly go to the cross for you and me. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. Obedience is always a love response. It's not a legal response, it's a love response. Just as His is. And... Uh, the result of a fruitful life is always a sense of personal fulfillment. That's the other. If, I, if you keep my commandments, that speaks of obedience. Under the law to Christ, 1 Corinthians 9. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And uh, so we'll leave that with the lawyers and move on here. And there's plenty of verses in your notes. You can work that out if, you, if it seems uh, uh, strange to you. Verse 11, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. That's why he spoke these things, so that our joy may be full. That's a gift from our Creator Himself. See, my joy is His joy. And a plethora is a fulfilled. It's a progressive fulfillment of the disciples' joy. It's progressive. And in verse 9, we talk about love. In verse 11, we'll talk about joy. And in verse 12, it'll be peace, as this builds up in here. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. That sums it all up. That's what he's trying to get across to us. Love one another. See, love ought to characterize all of our relationships to him, to each other, and even to the world in a strange way. You say, why doesn't it? Let me tell you where the good stuff is. We've got a lot of books and stuff out there to sell. Let me tell you where the real pay dirt is. There is a book that has changed more lives, saved more marriages than anything we've done in the 40, uh, four decades of our ministry. And that's a book called The Way of Agape. And the big part, you heard, I heard an amen there, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, The Way of Agape. And also a, a study called The Architecture of Man. These things will, uh, will penetrate through. It gets to the practical implications of what we're talking about. But continue, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You know, I spent a good part of my professional career as a professional soldier, in effect. And that's a noble profession. That may surprise you. But uh, being a soldier is, is a most... Why? Because he's laying down his life for his friends. Greater love hath no man than this, even in our you know, professional uh, horizons here. So, greater love has, can a man lay down. The cross, of course, is the ultimate display 
of sacrificial love. That's why we have this whole drama that started with the creation. God has all kinds of ways to demonstrate infinite power. He has all kinds of ways to demonstrate infinite knowledge. How do you demonstrate infinite love? By creating man, knowing that given free will, the man will get himself in a predicament that nothing less than the death of God would suffice to get him out of it. That's infinite love. That's what the whole drama is all about, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. The cross is the ultimate display of sacrificial love. It, that cross that was erected in Judea 2,000 years ago is going to be the pivot point for the entire universe, not only for you and me, but for the whole universe to be rebuilt. A new heaven and a new earth. Not just man is being redeemed here. Jesus continues, Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Chapter 15, verses 14 and 15 are staggering verses. Think this through. I call you not servants. Most of us thought we'd aspire to be a servant. Praise God. No, Jesus here is shifting the idiom from those that were his servants to those that he's calling his friends. What's the difference? It's very interesting. That word, one of the things about your Bible you need to discover for yourself is even though you've got 40 different, got more than 40 guys that wrote 66 books we call the Bible, you'll discover that the idioms and use of words is consistent through the whole thing very deliberately. And uh, Abraham was called a friend of God. And that was linked to the fact that God said, should I not show him what I'm going to do? The concept of friendship with Abraham, between he and God, was when he, God, he was a friend of God, that entitled him to know what God was going to do. That's what Jesus is underscoring here. I called you servants before, now you're my friends. And this, the, the badge of that will be, I'll share with you what I'm going to do. So letting you in on prophecy is part of the, the perspective. Let me take that to the extreme. There is one prophet in the Old Testament that was known as the beloved prophet. Which one was that? Daniel. Daniel, very good. And Daniel was given the apocalyptic visions that make him famous. In the New Testament, one of the disciples was known as the beloved disciple. Who was that? And what is his most famous book? The Revelation of Jesus Christ. You, you see the connections? Those idioms are not accidental. They're used consistently. The intimacy of prophecy. Abraham is a friend of God. God says, shall I not show him? And so forth. And they went from servants to be friends. Daniel was the beloved one. And of course, John was the beloved disciple. It's interesting how those ideas are consistently played. And, uh, and you can go through the verses and, 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 and uh, dig that out on your own if you like. Okay, back to verse 15 there. We use the term servants. The word in the Greek is doulos, which was actually technically means a bondservant. That was a kind of servitude where the person volunteered to remain with that house as a servant for the rest of his life. And he symbolized that by piercing his ear, and that was a badge of, of, of pride to them the doulos. And uh, it's interesting that um, you and I would consider ourselves as doulos, servants of Christ. There is a benefit he promises us that most people don't realize, and it's in 1 Thessalonians 5. We say that, that um, Jesus will come back like a thief in the night, right? Remember that phrase? That's to the people who live in darkness. In, in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul divides the world into two groups. Children of the day, children of darkness. That day will, that he will come as a thief of the night to those of the night. Not, but ye are not of the night, ye are of the day. That that overtake you as a thief. In other words, what he's saying is that the believer will not be caught by surprise. You won't know the day. We're not setting dates here. Don't misunderstand me. But the believer will not be surprised. He will be confronted with an expectancy of his arrival. So you, uh, I encourage you to explore very carefully First Thessalonians 5. But let's move on to verse 16 here in John 15. Jesus says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you 
that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Wow! There's that underscoring again. These things I command you that ye love one another. And he's echoing that same command again. And by the way, it's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's an imperative. And that is echoed all through the scripture. You're, you're, that's one reason we pass out the notes, so you don't have to try to copy those all down. They're all handed out to you, so you can double back on that at your leisure. It says, If the world hates you, ye know it ha that it hated me before it hated you. And uh, so this is ours before his arrest. We haven't gotten to Gethsemane yet. That'll occur after chapter 17. But it's coming, obviously. And this is ours before that arrest and crucifixion. And as a solemn warning, hatred will be used seven times forthcoming. That the world will hate you. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. The world hates you. Hate, detest, abhor. Anticipate opposition from the world. Opposition vindicates your discipleship. You're not getting opposition, something wrong. And by the way, anyone that doesn't believe in a, a personal, literal Satan, all you have to do is oppose him for a while. And that doubt will er evaporate very quickly. By the way, there's no evidence that there was any persecution while the Master was with them, interestingly enough. Seventy were sent forth back there in Luke 10. The Pharisees were critical, of course, in several places. Gethsemane is, even at Gethsemane, Jesus is in charge. Let these go their way. One of the strange things that you will encounter when we get to that chapter, chapter, uh, chapter 18, is that the guy that's in charge is Jesus. And he's the one that set the whole schedule of all of it. He caught Judas by surprise. They didn't plan to do it that night, but he made him do it that night. We'll get into all that here. And uh, so, uh, fishing unmolested in John 21 and so forth. As a shepherd, he goeth before them and so on. Let's get on verse 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Does the world hate you? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, this is no longer of, but out of. And again, the world appears five times here. So that's, uh, that's obviously the subject. And the year not of, we are not of this world, we're, we're, we understand. This is a call to separation. And uh, there's a concept of sovereign election that echoes through here. Remember in Luke 4, when he preached to them at Nazareth, their response to his sermon was to try to throw him off a cliff. And one of the things I encourage you to do is study that chapter Luke 4 and try to figure out what got them so angry. And the answer, of course, is the doctrine of election. Because he talks about Elijah, the widow of Zarephath, Elisha, and the Naaman the Syrian. These were all people that God favored. They were all Gentiles. And that may surprise you. And that's what got them upset. They were the chosen people, yet Jesus, their Messiah, was pointing out that God also deals with the... Uh, uh, there's more to it there. You can get it. They, 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 were, they were all Gentiles. But it's always the religious world which is enraged by Christ. You should not be surprised to find the religious world the one that's against you. And that's uh, something the Jewish believers are discovering comes from the denominational churches. There's lots of tension here in New Zealand over those, some of those issues. Verse 20, Jesus says, Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. And uh, the servant is not greater than his master. So if we're serving one another as we're instructed to, we can expect hostility, and that's echoed all through the, the epistles, of course, too. So they persecuted me. It, that word in the Greek originally meant to run off like a dog in a garden, but then it's used to overtake as in competition. Here it's used to pursue with hostile intent. And this, of course, this whole thing also rebukes our attempts to be popular. Think about that. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. See, it all echoes back to the Father. 
because they know not him that sent me. And they do this through ignorance. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had they not had sinned. But now they have no cloak for their sin. Exposing the sin of unbelief. Why is unbelief a sin? That's the reason. This is used in a comparative sense. And there's examples, of course, in Isaiah 40 and 1 Corinthians 3 and so forth. And there are, as a result of all of this, degrees of punishment. There are degrees of punishment. That's in Matthew 11 and Hebrews 10 and a lot of other places too. To whom much is given, much is required. Jesus goes on and says, He that hateth me hateth my Father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now they have both seen and hated both me and my Father. Wow. That's going to take on another coloration as we get into chapter 16 here. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And where does that show up first? It's in Psalm 69 in the description of Jesus' childhood. Many people are shocked to discover that his early years in Nazareth are echoed in, Psalm, in portions of Psalm 69. See, our natural state, you and me, is, is, is to be a hater of God. The written word testified against Israel. But when the comforters come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. He, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. So now he's promised, he's, he, he's going to be talking about his departure. But he's departing so that the, the Comforter can come, the Holy Spirit. When the Comforters come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth. Now it's interesting, we all through the Scripture, you know, the principle is that it always takes two witnesses. And that's exactly what's going on here. And so the eternal pro uh, procession from the Spirit, from beside the Father. There is a expression we used earlier in one of our, that several people commented on, they felt it was very illuminating. And so I wanted to put it here. The word Echad, here, O Israel, our Lord is one. The word is Echad, but it means the unification. It doesn't mean it's singular. It means a group that's been acting as unity, Echad. Uh, it means equal in nature, separate in person, and submissive in duties. That's a, an echo, if you will, from the Trinity. And the word Elohim, of course, as you may know, is a plural. But you may not know that in Hebrew, a plural requires three not two. They have a singular, a dual, and a, a plural. So, now we're moving into chapter 16, just to keep the continuity going here. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. And this is a fulfillment of the previous four verses. And offending here is really meaning a cause to stumble. We, we think of the word offending in a little different sense. Uh, but it's been scandalized or made to stumble. And the persecution always comes from the religious world. It comes from within. Don't be surprised if your most vigorous attacks come from the religious world. And when you encounter that, remember that the most anti-religious person that ever walked the earth is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because religion is man's attempt to reconcile himself with God, and you can't do it. And it's blasphemy to try. The initiative has to be from God towards us. And that's it. It's, we're interested in relationship, not religion. So opposition comes apparently in the name of God, blind zeal for God to be scattered. It's astonishing to discover that people that will be opposing you will believe that they're doing God's service in opposing you. You need to understand that. You need to understand that. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Wow. Wow. The church is supposed to convert the world. Or has it been the other way around? Has the church been converted by the world? That's a question I'll let you answer yourselves. The professing church has boasted that it would convert the world, but the world has converted, I suggest, the professing church. And you, to, to get at that, one of the best ways is to study Revelation 2 and 3. Revelation is the only book that has a command to study me, I'm special. No other book of the Bible has the audacity to say they're special. Revelation does. 
And the only part of that fabulous book that really affects us directly is chapters 2 and 3. Seven letters written by Jesus himself. Report cards on the church, individually and collectively. Study that and you'll learn a great deal. The persecution of Christ's people comes from the religious world, interestingly enough. And the delusion that perpetrators would imagine that they are doing God's service, and that's not only in Proverbs 29, Abraham 5, a lot of other places. And so, expelled from a synagogue. That doesn't mean much to you and I because we're in a Jewish culture. That really meant cut off socially from family and friends, lasting disgrace, perpetual danger, even death. That's what that really implies. And uh, it's interesting to me that J. Vernon McGee, many, many years ago, I, he passed away several decades ago, still on the radio through a trust that continues that, um, his, his recordings. But he predicted more than 20 years ago that the true believers in America, he was speaking of, uh, will eventually have to go underground, no surprise. But he also predicted that the attack against them will come from the denominational churches. And I was stunned by that because he was not a fringe guy. He was a very center line kind of guy. My wife and I published a book called Kingdom, Power, and Glory. And it's, it was astonishing to see how controversial that book was in certain uh, domains in the United States because it was a call to accountability. There are people, I often say, people that thought that, uh, gee, I'm saved. My feet are on the desk. I'm, that, that's it. The idea of being that behavior matters came as a shock. And the vigor and the militancy of some of the con contrary things, just amazing. Fortunately, we had people in our background that are experts in exegetical things and confirmed that we were on the right track. And strangely enough, the Chinese leadership has fallen in love with that book too, so it's interesting. I think they do with God's service. And that word, same word in the Greek there is to describe the service of a priest at the altar. They'll think they're doing holy work by opposing you. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. Wow. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. But see, he's preparing them for the, his departure. He knows what's coming in the next few hours. Before sunup, he's going to go through six trials. Three Jewish and... and and, and three uh, Roman. That's all coming within the next 24 hours from his this uh, discussion with him. But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you ask me, whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And most of Paul's epistles try to get across to us how uniquely precious that is to us in, in the group that we call the church, using that church in the mystical sense. And uh, most of us don't understand some of Paul's answers because we don't understand what the question is that he's dealing with. That the Holy Spirit seals us, that he indwells us, that's unthinkable. And Paul was educated by Gamaliel. He, he, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And yet that discovery the Lord shared blew him away. And so, it is expedient for you that I go away. The comforter to the world will be in verses 7 to 11, and the comforter to the believer will be in the following few verses. That's what's coming downstream here. It is expedient. Together and Pharaoh to bear or bring, bringing one together with good things, profitable in other words. Expedient, even the way we use the term, I think, is, is a good thing. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And uh, by the way, the pronoun usually agrees with the gender of the noun it's replacing. The word spirit is neuter. The masculine pronoun emphasizes the personhood of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in other places, the neuter pronoun is used in keeping with correct grammar, but there's an underscore here in effect. And when he is come, it's a person. It's not a force. It's, um, you know, of course, the son, the son of God loves you, right? You know that the Father loves you. Did you know that the Holy Spirit loves you? He, he must, because he, you can grieve him. You can't grieve someone who doesn't love you. He's a person, interestingly enough. 
when he has come, masculine pronoun, uh, there are three genders in the Greek, but let's get on to that. He, and we will rep reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And the, the reprove, re uh, convict, refute an adversary completely, demonstrate guilt so that the truth of the charge will be acknowledged. It's objective condemnation, not subjective realization. Very important. The Holy Spirit ought not to be here at all. Christ ought to be here. But the, the Father sent him, but the world wouldn't have him. Wow. But he would not leave us orphans. Taking the place of an absent Christ, the guilt of the world is demonstrated. And that's the significance of the last verse of Hosea 5, where God says through Hosea, I will return to my place. That means God must have left it. I'll return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. And that Offense is singular and specific. It's the rejection of the Messiah. But Jesus continues here, and when he has come, he, they're speaking of the Holy Spirit. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin and of righteousness in respect to, if you will, of sin and righteousness. Harmatius, it's a missing the mark. And uh, it's the general area in which all of us miss the mark. And that's unbelief. And of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, and of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. See, Christ is the standard of the righteousness. And he says, I go to my Father. And uh, Upago, I, I'm going. He emphasized the personal relationship, separating himself. It's a progressive revelation, obviously. And uh, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Men will be convicted to judgment because Satan has been judged. And uh, it's a perfect passive uh, indicative form of the verb to judge. It's, it, it's complete actually. It refers to the cross, judgment of Jesus Christ. There's a final judgment that takes place after the thousand year reign. Don't, don't confuse those two issues. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. And that's interesting. Uh, that's designed uh, to carry off. The Holy Spirit would complete their understanding is the idea. And this is a six, uh, John 16, verse 13 is one of those special verses you want to note here. Jesus says, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of Truth, that's His idiom for the Holy Spirit, when, the Spirit is, uh, when He, the Spirit of Truth, is come, He will guide you into most truth. Is that what it says? What does it say? All truth. Oh, wait a minute. That's quite a strong statement. He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now, it's interesting to me. Notice it says he shall not speak of himself. It fascinates me to study the Bible. I've studied for 65 years. You go through the Bible... And every time in an allegory or a model that the Holy Spirit is present in the allegory, he's always in the form of an unnamed servant. Um, obviously, most of you are familiar with Genesis 22, where Abraham offers Isaac and up on the hill, you know the story. And you know at the last minute there's a substitution and so forth. Um, Abraham is the type of the father, Isaac the type of the son, and so forth. Two chapters later, in chapter 24, Abraham commissions his eldest servant to get a bride for Isaac. And again and again, Abraham is the type of the father, the, his, his eldest servant. And now there, you can find out what his name is from Genesis 15 or 17. You can figure it out. It's Eliezer. And the word Eliezer means comforter. But again, he's an unnamed servant in the model. When you get to the book of Ruth, you've got Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, You've got, he ends up getting a Gentile bride, Ruth, and through which Naomi, the name of Israel, gets the land and so forth. And it's interesting who introduces uh, Boaz to Ruth, an unnamed servant in chapter 1. And so you watch all that, or actually chapter 2. But the point is, it's interesting that this idea of the Holy Spirit being an unnamed servant is an editorial consistency throughout the Bible. Because he will not testify, he will not speak of himself. And that's why studies in the Holy Spirit require a special handling. 
But there's something else from this that I love to point out to you. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. This gives you an opportunity to conduct an experiment in supernatural events. When you discover a verse in the Bible that confuses you, it seems contradictory, or for whatever reason puzzles you, what I want you to do is go get a, a, a blank book, a journal as they call them, in a stationery, and, re, and resolve that no one will ever see that journal but yourself. I say that so you'll be honest. It'll never be seen by somebody else. Guard it. Find a page. Put down the reference that's confusing you. And here's the tough part. Write down why it makes no sense to you and do it in ink. So you can't change it. But try to express why it is that verse seems contradictory or whatever reason it's confusing you, jot it down. Once you've done that, take that to the, to the Lord. In your quiet time, go before the throne of grace, the throne room of the universe, and say, you've promised that the Spirit of truth would guide me to all truth. Well, I'm confused about Hezekiah chapter 7, verse 13, or whatever it is. I'm making that up. And ask him to, you say, you promised that you would give me, you'd guide me to all truth. Well, this is a truth that I want to understand. I'm sincere. I really want to understand the truth. And I'm putting it before you. And I, 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 I plead the blood of Christ on my behalf and so forth. But however you do that. And tie it off. Now, it may not be the next 10 seconds. But what's going to happen will blow you away. You will be reading somewhere else. It may not even be in the Bible. And something, suddenly it will become clear what we're talking about. You'll be in a restaurant and overhear a conversation having nothing to do with it. But somehow the Holy Spirit will cause something to happen in your intellectual life to cause that conundrum to be dissolved. That's, in fact, it's going to be so obvious. What I want you to do is go back to your journal, find that page, put the date, and put down what it means. But you say, check why all the paperwork. Because I want you to keep that journal will become one of the most precious. It will be meaningless to anybody else. And don't let anybody else see it because I want you to keep it candid to yourself. But that, you will go through the valley of doubt. There'll be times when you're really in darkness. And I want you to be able to go back to that journal and see the footprints of the Holy Spirit as He carried you in your walk. Anyway, that's my logbook challenge. Let's move on here. He will not speak of Himself. And the unnamed servant, I've, I've done that before. He will guide you to most truth. No, no, all truth. And that's what I call the logbook challenge. Okay. And... Uh, uh, well, all truth is an adverb, completely. The adverb complete implies inspiration, inerrancy, and authority of the New Testament, by the way. And so, uh, and he will show you things to come. And isn't that exciting? He will completely lead you to, to, uh, tr into truth. Um, his revealing to the, the apostles, the New Testament truth was complete, not partial. Their lack of understanding demonstrated the need for the Holy Spirit to come. And the... This is the only occurrence in the New Testament of that word. Not only in eschatology, but doctrines of an ecclesiology and pneumatology in the epistles and acts and so forth. It's an all-inclusive commitment, showing them things to come, declare, announce, and so forth. And that's, that's also a term used for the formal preaching of the gospel. And in chapter 14, we talked about that the past. John 15 is the present. And now in John 16, 13, it's the future. Past, present, future, all embraced by that term. And in Jesus' seven letters to seven churches, he lays out in advance the history of the church throughout history. If those letters were in any other order, it wouldn't be true. But it takes diligence to, re to really study that area. And uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. He that hath an ear, every one of us that have an ear are bound to that. Those seven, not the individual ones. So, there are seven things in the Holy Spirit's ministry. He would act as a spirit of truth, obviously. He would guide believers into all truth. He would not speak of himself. He would speak what he had heard. He would show believers things to come. And he would glorify Christ. And he would, ta and he would take of the things of Christ and show them unto his people. Straightforward stuff. Personally to you and me, he quickens us. He indwells us. He loves us. He leads us. He gives assurance of our sonship. This is on the references there. You can track this down to confirm it in your own life. 
He helps our infirmities by making intercession. Jesus' job right now is to pray for us. Wow. That's his full-time occupation right now. Hebrews 4.12 and so on. He sealed us under the day of redemption. He has sealed us under the day of redemption. There are people that want to argue about and they're wasting their time. He will, Jesus says, He shall glorify me, He shall receive of mine, and He shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore, said I, that He shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Wow. And uh, the Holy Spirit will glorify Christ, not Himself. The Holy Spirit will not glorify Himself. Anytime you see the Holy Spirit glorified, watch out. That may be a piece of confusion. Nowhere in the epistles has the Holy Spirit told us anything about the Father which had not previously been revealed in and by the Lord Jesus. And so, uh, okay. He will guide, declare, and glorify. Jesus says, A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. And uh, they lost sight of him for a little while. Remember the Emmaus Road experience. And... Uh, and his disciples should have known this, but they forgot. They remembered it later. Passion of Pentecost, departure and final return. Let's move. Then said some of the disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me. And because I go to the... The disciples are confused. And one of the evidence of the Holy Spirit is how that confusion will later lift. Jesus knew. We need never be embarrassed about coming to Him with any problem or need. And that's in Isaiah 65 of all places. When it hurts too much to cr even cry, remember the Comforter has come. Those are the verses 7 to 15 here. Be assured that God will ultimately turn your sorrow into joy. Verses 21 and, 20, 21 and 22 that we just went through. Take advantage of your tremendous power. It will shock you to discover just how much power has made available to you. And claim the victorious peace of Christ in every battle. Claim victory in every battle. Jesus goes on here then, and they said, Therefore, what is this that he saith? A little while. We cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of what I said? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned unto joy. And very, that's that double verily formula that he uses, but he wants to emphasize something. It's interesting that we have this Old Testament childbirth illustration, deep sorrow turned to lasting joy. He uses it here, and it may surprise you to discover that's also used in Isaiah when you have the, the rapture mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, that's in Isaiah 26, uh, starting about verse 19. But if you start verse 17, they set the stage with this travail Id idiom again, even back there. Here it, it highlights it. A woman when she is in travail hath sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish. For the joy that is a man's is born into the world. Now, it's interesting that if you say, well, the, the rapture doesn't show up in the Old Testament. I think we dealt with that when we were in chapter 14 of John. But when you go to the Isaiah passage, start two verses earlier and notice the set. The stage is set there to fit this. And of course, the word anguish here is the word, same word that's used in tribulation in the New Testament, by the way. And ye, now, and, ye, and ye now, therefore, have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice. He's talking about the resurrection here in advance, see? And your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily I, verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Well, and this is the seventh and the final uh, occasion in the Upper Room Discourse where the verily, verily, the, the double uh, thing. And uh, so, and the word ask occurs in two different words, questioning or making a demand, and there are two different words in the two places. But anyway, let's move on. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name, ask and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Fascinating how he is concerned with their joy. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. And uh, again, ask there is in the present tense, which means continuous asking. It's something you're never finished asking. 
And of course, the Proverbs we've dealt with in chapter 10 with the shepherd and sheep, the vine and the branches in chapter 15, and the woman in labor here in chapter 16. Let's move on. And that day shall ye ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. The Father loves you because you have loved me. In the value of his person is the point. I came forth from the Father, and I am come into the world. And again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Indeed. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee? By this we believe, that thou camest forth from God. And so, see, the the disciples' knowledge falls short of Jesus' knowledge. Um, The the, uh, Oideman knowledge is as the blind speak of color. Jesus answered and said, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good, uh, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You know, Jesus' life began with a declaration of peace and the Annunciation in Luke chapter 2. Here he concludes his final message to the disciples before the cross with a message of peace that opens and closes them, in a sense. Be of good cheer. It's the only occurrence elsewhere in his verb calling for... Be of good cheer, it's the only occurrence. Elsewhere, it's a verb calling for courage in the face of perceived danger. So it's a strange kind of cheer, if you will. He overcame overcame the world that Noah condemned, according to Hebrews 11, verse 7. So you and I are living in two worlds, twofold love. Are you living in Christ or in the world? You either have peace or tribulation, take your pick. Twofold secret. I have overcome. In the world, you should exchange that for cheer. Okay, we have slipped through two chapters here. For the next session... I'm going to encourage you to spend some time in chapter 17. We always call, when we speak of the Lord's Prayer, we're referring to something that he, he expressed to teach the disciples how to pray. That should be called the Disciples' Prayer, but everybody calls it the Lord's Prayer. If you're, the Lord's Prayer is here. Chapter 17, you're going to have the privilege of um, listening in, so to speak, on the Lord's personal prayer to the Father. It is incredible. You're going to look behind the veil, if you will, into the personal needs and desires of Jesus as he talks to the Father. It's the simplest of language, but it's probably the most profound in meaning in the entire New Testament. So it's going to raise issues that you're going to want to really absorb. So I encourage you to look look at that very carefully. Many people call chapter 17 of John the Holy of Holies of the New Testament because it's the Lord's dialogue, so to speak, with the Father. And it's uh, extremely limited. From that, we'll go to chapter 18 where they're in Gethsemane. We've been in the upper room. Scholars argue whether chapter 17 was still in the upper room or on the way to Gethsemane or that's a waste of time to argue about that. Who knows? We do know that they end up in Gethsemane, and then you know what goes on there. But the point is, is that uh, uh, this is the bridge, in a sense, between the private coaching of the disciples that are finished in chapter 16. Jesus is now going to pray with the Father. When we're through with chapter 17, we're into chapter 18, and that's Gethsemane and the arrest and six trials, three Jewish and three Gentile trials. And so... The pace is picking up. Virtually half of the Gospel of John deals with the last week of his ministry. And uh, it is also a Gospel which presumes, many people read it as the first Gospel, and that's fine, but it also it actually presumes you've read the other three, interestingly enough. And so with that, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. And we thank you, Father, for this time together that you've appointed. We know that there are no accidents in your kingdom, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. And it's our petition to you, Father, pleading the blood of Jesus Christ, 
that your purpose would be accomplished in each of our lives. That you would reveal to each of us precisely what it is that you would have of us in the days ahead. As we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservations whatsoever. In the name of Yeshua, our coming King, the Lord Jesus Christ indeed. Amen.